This podcast represents the opinions of our hosts and their guests only. The content here should not be taken as medical advice and is for informational purposes only. And because each person is so unique, please consult your healthcare professional for any medical questions. Welcome to Once Shattered, Picking Up the Pieces. Linda Major, Jack Major, and Ellen Bennett are three fierce advocates, two moms and a dad who are passionate about changing the way eating disorders and mental illness are viewed in our society. Linda, Jack, and Ellen believe we need to stop the stigma, band together, and help people find resources and support early on. They advocate to foster awareness, enhance education, and improve treatment, as well as to help society understand and embrace individuals and families who are affected by eating disorders and all mental health conditions. Thank you for joining us today and welcome to Once Shattered, Picking Up the Pieces, episode 107. Our special guest will be Janet Shabindak, RDN, Registered Dietitian Nutritionist, PhD. And the title of our podcast this week is Eating Disorders, Imparting Knowledge, Inspiring Change, and Acquiring Understanding. I'd like to introduce you first to my co-host, my husband and my soulmate, Jack Major, and my uh, our dear friend and fellow advocate, Ellen Bennett. Hi, Linda. Hi, Ellen. And welcome to all our listeners today. We are back again. So glad you've joined us. And remember, everyone, all contact information, resources, and links are in the show notes. Please send us an email. We'd love to hear from you. Absolutely. Well, Ellen and Jack, I came across this quote by William Arthur Ward, and I thought it would be perfect to begin this special podcast. And the quote is, teaching is more than imparting knowledge. It is inspiring change. Learning is more than absorbing facts. It is acquiring understanding. Does this quote resonate with the two of you at all? Well, it does with me. I mean, you know, I... uh went to high school and went to college, became a pharmacist, and I learned a lot of things during that, uh, that time. But uh, the most important thing I learned was after I got out and uh, you know had my degree, my best teaching was out in the field with patients. You know, that's when it resonated with me as to why I went to pharmacy school and what I was supposed to do. I learned a lot of knowledge and retain some of it, Um, you know, it's either use it or lose it. And um, they they give you a lot of avenues to go. But I think just uh, dealing with patients and, and, you know, um, understanding where they're coming from uh, when they would come into my pharmacy was uh, the best lessons that I ever learned. It's so true. It really resonates with me um, with background in education And I always remember telling kids, you know, this is what we're learning. This is why we're learning it. This is how we're, how you're going to use it. You know, attaching that there's, there's purpose, there's purpose here. And it also makes me reflect on my journey with eating disorders in terms of I needed to seek. I was inspired to learn. I needed to seek knowledge. And it was really the opportunity to um, gain understanding that awakened me to a lot of a deeper understanding. So it's beautiful. Well, our guest is Dr. Janet Shabendak. She's a researcher and an associate profession, uh, professor that strives to make sure her graduate students absorb more than just the facts. Jack. Um, Will you start her her bio for us, honey? Sure, Linda. Uh, Dr. Janet Shebendak is a registered dietitian nutritionist. She received a master's degree in clinical nutrition from New York University and a PhD with distinction in behavioral nutrition from Columbia University Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Dr. Shebendak has over 40 years experience in the field of eating disorders. 40 years. 
So collectively, we have quite a quite an astonishing number of years here. All right. From 1978 to 2002, Dr. Shebendak worked as a nutritionalist and later as a nutritionist in charge in the Division of Adolescent Medicine Eating Disorder Treatment Program at Schneider's Children's Hospital, Long Island, Jewish Medical Center, New York. At present, Dr. Shedendock is the Director of Research Nutrition and the Eating Disorder Behavior Laboratory at the New York State Psychiatric Institute Eating Disorder Research Center Unit at Columbia University Irving Medical Center, CUIMC. Her faculty appointments include Associate Professor of Neurobiology and Psychiatry at Columbia University Irving Medical Center and adjunct associate professor in the Department of Health and Behavior Studies at Teachers College, Columbia University, where she teaches a graduate course entitled Eating Disorders, Awareness, Prevention, and Treatment. We are very honored to have you with us today, Janet. You are a very special guest, and thank you. Janet, when we uh, reached out to you to see if you would uh, do a podcast with us, I was so happy that you agreed and... um, I know we've done other things with you in the past, and uh, your bio is is just so impressive. And uh, you know, forty years of working with eating disorder patients, uh, I'm sure has been uh, very rewarding. It's an honor to have you. It's really unique, I think, because the connection between Jack and Linda writing their book, you reading it, you having your students read this book as part of. Um, their curriculum and the structure of your program is, and then you joining us to have a conversation is just unique and amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Jana, in addition to all that you've achieved academically, you've dedicated your entire career to many different facets of eating disorders, working with adolescents, conducting research, and teaching our up-and-coming nutrition and psychology graduate students. Can you tell us what drew you to begin working in this field? Um, Sure. And I always think my career path was just, um, it it just kind of fell in in my path, to be honest with you. You know, in in 1978, I was a recent graduate from uh, undergrad, uh, Pratt Institute, and um, was lucky enough to land a job at LIJ. I was so excited to be working at a teaching hospital. And as part of the training, we would rotate through all the clinical units um, and uh, clinical and general and both and specialized. And this included adolescent medicine, which I quickly fell in love with. Um, I actually um, was in charge of pediatrics, um, the pediatric ICU and adolescent medicine at, in my, my first job assignment, a permanent job assignment. And shortly after I got that assignment, I um, we wound up getting a, a young woman, a young adolescent admitted to the unit with a tentative diagnosis of anorexia nervosa. And, you know, honestly, the staff was just, you know, we were all beside ourselves. We didn't quite know what to do with this young girl. I mean, she was markedly cachectic and, you know, none of us really knew the best way to approach anything, the refeeding, the management. We were really, you know, um, you know, just making the best of a situation that none of us were really prepared for. And, um, we did a reasonably good job of managing this patient, despite really having no structured program in place. And um, uh, for whatever the reason, we started getting referrals. I mean, we were surprised that there were more individuals out there like this that um, needed our help. But, you know, what ultimately followed was that we developed a structured behavioral program, uh, a multidisciplinary team. Um and I was just at the right place at the right time and was fortunate to become a founding member of that team of individuals that, that we had no idea what the heck we were doing, <laughs> but we were all learning um, quickly. 
And in collaboration with child psychiatry, um, adolescent medicine developed um, really what became um, a, a phenomenal inpatient, day patient, and specialized outpatient treat treatment program. And it was the first of its kind in the tri-state area in that, at that uh, period of time. And uh, what did, um, what we did become aware of though, was that, you know, that there were very specific um, treatment guidelines that were gonna be needed for the management of growing teenagers with eating disorders who were this profoundly malnourished. And um, in collaboration with the Society for Adolescent uh, Medicine, now the Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine, our division actually worked to publish the first practice guideline and position paper on managing um, adolescents with eating disorders. Um, so it was really a great honor. And we all learned how to function as a team and respect each other's disciplines and um, collaborate to really find the best way to, you know, help these individuals. Janet, and, G Janet mm -hmm. can I know? Yeah. Um, so what ages were you seeing? Um, uh, we were at, the, at, at Schneider, we were seeing from the early teens through maybe uh, early college age. Okay. okay. Um, and, uh, you know, over time when with the program, you know, we had many individuals that were, you know, under our care for, for a very long period of time from their first diagnosis through, you know, finishing high school, getting into college, coming back to check in with us when they were in grad school. I mean, I do think that that was one of the things that made the program so successful is that we had a very intact treatment team and that we were all very connected to these individuals and they were really able to reach out to us if they were having difficulties, come back in if they were out of state and you know if away at school, they could still check in with us, come back in for visits. So there was a real continuity of care. You know, we did have the inpatient program, the day treatment program, and we had a, a really excellent specialized outpatient treatment program. And it was a program that focused on these adolescents and their families, you know, the families were very involved. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really um, an amazing experience and a blessing in terms of my own knowledge to have been able to grow up in the field in that particular program, yeah. LIJ, which has um, evolved into Schneider's Children's Hospital, but is now Cohen's Children's Hospital. And it is still one of the members of the Centers of Excellence uh, in New York State that we collaborate with at Psychiatric Institute. Okay. Collab um, yeah, collaboration I, is so important. I mean, it, it, it was just to this day, probably, you know, a, a highlight, no doubt, of my career. And it, it dictated my career path in many ways. Um, but with really, it was a very difficult decision in 2002. Um, I decided that I needed to move on and, you know, I wanted to get an advanced degree, which was very difficult to do when you were working in adolescent medicine and the one o'clock appointments and the 12 o'clock appointments would all show up at three o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> and it was very difficult to get to class because the um, clinic never ended till about seven or eight at night. Um, and so I made a decision that to leave and, um, and shortly thereafter, about six months after that, I uh, was fortunate enough, again, and I've had a lot of good fortune in my life, um, was to um, find out about a job at Columbia looking for somebody in the eating disorder research unit to uh, manage a multi-site um, uh, study, translational grant study on uh, um, eating disorders. And um, I was fortunate to get that position and was working on that while I was working on my doctorate. And um, I've been there. I've been here ever since. Um, but uh, on a very different path, really much more research focused at Schneider, uh, LIJ Schneider. I, it was a great opportunity. It was clinical. It was um, academic medicine, uh, writing, so, uh, a good deal of research. Um, and it's that. Uh, at Psychiatric Institute, um, 
it's I'm much more focused on the research aspects of it. And of course, throughout all this time, I started teaching. So I've also been teaching for probably close to 40 years as well, teaching a course on eating disorders. Janet, can you, can you paint us a, a broad picture of that eating disorder research unit? Um, it seems a little complicated on paper, <laughs> um, but I'm housed right now in the New York State Psychiatric Institute, which is on the Columbia University Medical Center campus. And it's a very unique facility in that, you know, our, our medical staff, our physicians come from the College of Physicians and Surgeons at Columbia. Um, we have staff here that's from Research Foundation for Mental Hygiene and other staff um, that's uh, under New York State. And um, what makes it so unique is that treatment is free. Um, if someone is interested and qualifies for research, um, they receive really excellent clinical care on our inpatient unit. Um, the length of stay is not an issue because no finances uh, are involved. And um, it really does allow us to give the patient more time to kind of experience normalization uh, of eating behaviors. Uh, um, we also have though the Outlook at Westchester, which is also a clinical inpatient unit treating adolescents uh, through adults, male, female, um, which is a more traditional, it, it's not a research unit, it's, a, it's an excellent clinical care unit. Um, and sometimes <clears throat> patients come to us from that unit and sometimes you know, patients leave our unit, and go back, go to the Outlook as well if they need a little more care. That's probably more unique because our patients can really stay at psychiatric institutes really as, as long as they need to. So that's extremely wow. unique not to have an insurance company hovering over your shoulder. Uh, the Outlook at Westchester is a beautiful facility, but it, it, is, a more, it is a more traditional um, insurance-based treatment program for people who are not comfortable um, with doing research. Um, and then, of course, there's also a partial hospitalization program that's offered through the Outlook um, as kind of a step down um, for additional support. Do you get people from Outlook that go into the research unit um, once yeah, they're Yeah, there have been individuals that um, start at Outlook and um, go, they may get some, some of their um, nutritional restoration started there. And then it's decided that for, for whatever the reason that perhaps psychiatric institute might be a better place for them. They may need a longer length of hospitalization. Maybe this was a person who wasn't interested in participating in research in the beginning and they've changed their mind. They've gotten used because there is, um, uh, you know, some staff overlap between the two facilities, not much, but there's an umbrella and Dr. Atia is, uh, Evelyn Atia is, um, over both, so to speak. So um, there's a lot of collaboration between um, the treatment teams. If somebody, if they feel somebody is better in one place than another, um, it's it, there is a fluidity about it. And and again, is it open to all ages, or is it just the adolescents? Yeah, uh, psychiatric in, in, up until recently, we were not at psychiatric institute doing research that included adolescents, but we now are. So we treat male and female adolescents through adults. So you, our study, our group usually go up to about age 45. And the same is true for the outlook. Adolescents through adulthood, male and female. Um, and, uh, you know, so a broad, you know, a broad age uh, representation in both facilities. Okay. Thank you. Um this next question is kind of multi-part. Um, uh, uh, as the director of the Research, Nutrition, and Eating <clears throat> Behavior Laboratory at New York State Psychiatric Institute, can you share who your colleagues are and about the eating disorder protocols you design, why you designed them the way you did, and a little about the patients you work with and anything else you'd like to share about your research? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, first and foremost, uh, you know, I'm privileged to work with a brilliant team of clinicians and researchers who really, you know, are leaders in the field. These are the people who are writing the diagnostic, among the people writing the diagnostic criteria for these eating disorders. So, it, again, I've been blessed so many times. Um, uh, Dr. Tim Walsh, who um, does, I believe designed and opened the unit in 1979. Uh, Dr. Joanna Steinglass, who's doing longitudinal studies looking at um, uh, neurocognitive changes and um, uh, changes in eating behavior over time in adolescence. Dr. Evelyn Atia, who who's basically the umbrella person over both the Outlook and Psychiatric Institutes program. Mike Devlin, who does a lot of work with binge eating disorder. Laurel Mayer does work that crosses over with the Obesity Research Center across the street of Columbia, We're looking at you know binge eating behavior, obesity overlap in, in those diagnostic groups. Um, and then we have a team of incredibly gifted PhD psychologists, uh, research fellows, social workers. So we've got a very big staff, including extremely hardworking and very smart research assistants. I always look at this as like, it really takes a village to do what we do here. And so a lot of what I do actually is um, to to be posed with, you know, a research question or a grant that one of the PIs is working on and to come up with protocol, uh, uh, needing behavior or food related or other as some food related aspect um, related to a protocol that will help answer their research question. Um, you know, um, you know, as as you all know, uh, um, patients with anorexia nervosa can be very can be effectively weight restored on a good clinical unit, and you know they will hopefully reach a, a minimum treatment goal. Although I, I know in, in your case, Linda and Jack, that that was always not always so successful with Emily, but. Um, you know, it, it's probably the easiest part of the job is to get the weight on. The bigger the bigger question is how can we keep the weight on because the relapse rate after after discharge is really quite high. Uh, you know, and it has a, it is among the highest relapse rate of psychiatric diagnoses. Um, and you know what we know happens is that maybe very quickly or maybe gradually patients tend to regress and resume their former eating behaviors, restrictive eating behaviors. Um, so that, you know, our research is really investigate, you know, the type and degree of dietary restriction, psychosocial and neurocognitive precipitants that are involved in those decisions, the impact of the decisions. Um, change in their eating behaviors and food choice during the nutrition rehabilitation process, and the impact of these treatment um, interventions on eating behavior and food choice. Ultimately, all of this, the goal of all this is, is to come up with better treatments that will um, protect patients, we hope, from going through these relapses. Um, and, you know, the types of studies that I'm involved with. Um, single item meals, multi item meals, food exposure therapies. Um, and many of these are conducted in um, uh, along with neurocognitive testing and imaging studies to take a look at, you know, changes um, in, in the overall, you know, cognitive system that may be um, helping or, or hindering um, true recovery. Um, I mean, overall, the goal is to kind of help the researchers come up with and you know, answer the questions that will have, a, you know, a meaningful impact on the patient's clinical care while they're in, in the hospital, but also their overall treatment outcome. It's not just about what happens here, and what, it's what happens when they leave. You mm -hmm. know, we really are um, focused on, you know, preventing relapse. Um, my own research, I've also been given the opportunity to, um, you know, design and 
um, come up with my own research questions. And uh, one of a couple of the things that I focused on um, in collaboration with actually Dr. Diane Klein, who is a research fellow here, and now she is with NYU. We looked at motivation for sweet taste. And that's important because, of course, you know, a lot of people think that anorexia nervosa is a loss of appetite, but it's a severe denial of appetite. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Dr. Klein is very interested in artificial sweetener use and um, uh, differences um, in the desire for and the use of artificial sweeteners, whether or not there was some motivated behavior um, there that we needed to look at. My own, uh, my own um, interest has really uh, also been around dietary fat. We know that fat restriction is a bit, is a big problem for these patients. Mm -hmm. They restrict fat, and that that in turn restricts caloric intake, and I've looked at, um, I've designed and um, published studies looking at stated fat preference in these individuals and how that relates to what they eat in the laboratory, our multi-item meal laboratories, and also their perception of fat taste. One of the things that's come up has been like, well, I, I can't eat food with fat in it. I taste it right away. It makes me nauseous. It, you know, um, and then actually one of the one of the studies I did where we looked at um, uh, and again, it's one type of fat containing food, but it's one where it's it's um, texture is much more easily masked where we looked at um, three types of cream cheese, fat free, low fat and full fat <laughs> cream cheese. And we had three flights, little gelato spoons. We had three flights of um these three types of cream cheeses that were randomized. So they, they actually had nine tastings where the, the individual would taste and rate and, uh, uh, and rinse their palate. And the bottom line was they were no, the, the patients with anorexia nervosa were no um, better at identifying full fat products than were the controls in the study. Mm -hmm. So that we've been able to use this information that we gather with patients, you know, kind of clinically as well to say, well, you, you tell us this, but let us tell you a little bit about what we've observed when we've studied some of these things. Um, and even to give, you know, parents and other people involved in the feeding process um, information about, you know, what may be um, a real physiological response and what might be more of a fear response or a psychological response to a food. Um, I've looked at reinforcing efficacy and the reward value of the binge experience in patients with, with bulimia nervosa. And um, perhaps for me, um, the most important thing I've worked on was the, um, uh, the characteristics of the diet known as energy density and diet variety, which there's a body of literature out there in all populations about the impact of these um, particular um, characteristics. And part of this was the work I did for my doctoral dissertation. And we had to kind of narrow down. Um, we we couldn't look at every macronutrient separately because there was just going to be too many variables. And then looking in the literature, I said, well, let me look at diet variety and um, energy density, which you can collapse into single scores. And I started looking at um, records from Dr. Mayer's study, did a, a really eloquent uh, body composition study, a very well-respected or renowned study on body composition changes in um, after recovering patients with anorexia nervosa. And part of that study required that patients maintain very diligent um, food records. And this was started in the hospital when they got to their weight goal, treatment weight goal. And then they continued this, this documentation throughout the first year after um, uh, discharge. And I started analyzing and it was really, it was good because I was totally blinded to these individuals. So I had no bias set, set in, uh, no bias whatsoever. I did not know these individuals. I started analyzing everything. And what became very apparent to me was that even on an inpatient basis, even though the patients were following their prescribed calorie 
levels, 2,600, 3,000, whatever they were um, prescribed at that period in the hospital, they already had begun. Some of these individuals had already begun to modify the food choices that they were making. They were selecting the total amount of calories that they needed to, but they were doing it by choosing lower energy dense foods. So they were eating more food, but food that was of lower energy content. Um, and they were also limiting their variety. We have a very nice kitchen here, a small kitchen that's you know very gracious in terms of providing patients with what they want. And all of a sudden, when I'm reviewing these records, I'm seeing, you know, I'm no longer when the when the dietitian was providing their food, you know, you'd see, you know, an apple, banana, grapes, uh, <laughs> melon. All of a sudden, I'm looking at these food records and I'm seeing apple, 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 apple. Every day they're starting when they were given the privilege to start selecting their own food, they started to. Uh, they were very redundant. And there's something called sensory specific satiety, where the more you keep eating something, mm. the, a similar food, the less appetitive it is, the less mm. you want to continue to eat it. And that's interesting. And, and we found that actually there was some literature from the National Weight Control Registry that had been put out that said, gee, if you want to lose weight and keep it off, um, limit the variety that, of foods that you eat across all food groups and even within a food group and limit your energy density. So lo and behold, what our patients were doing, um, many of them, um, was what was just being bad. recommended by the <laughs> National Weight Control Registry for <laughs> patients to keep their weight off. And, and um, what we found was we looked at these energy density scores and diet variety scores that were done at 90% of ideal body weight in the hospital. And we were able to predict who was going to relapse over that next year from these two dietary scores. So we've been able to use this, help nutritionists, therapists, that so you have to pay attention to not just the caloric intake, but the variety in the diet, and the energy density of the specific foods that the individual is selecting. Oh, this, that's, that's quite a that's finding. Huh? It's amazing. And yeah. it's... So if, if a person relapses, can they go through the um, research center again or... Yeah, we've, we have had um, patients that we've been able to accommodate um, to offer another um, you know, participation in, in another study mm -hmm. so they can return um, if they wanted to uh, under some rare circumstances when when we have clinical beds available, um, you know, we will always try. They, they do try very hard here to accommodate somebody that's worked with us and helped us through the research and find another way if they choose to come back and if they're struggling Oh, that's um, great. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, there is a loyalty that I've seen to the to the patients for sure. Do you find adults are less um, likely to do the research as opposed to adolescents? Um, well, you know, it's we've traditionally been a unit that did the research in in the group of eighteen to forty five. Okay, and. It's only the last several years with Dr. Steinglass's study that we have started to incorporate the younger adolescent that at a time where we would be capturing perhaps a newly diagnosed individual, mm -hmm. you know, so um, to see and, and I guess overall to see if you, you know, do if we have an intervention to see the um, intervention effect in the newly diagnosed or the recently diagnosed versus someone who may be ill for a number of years to yeah. really see what works. They're really two sets of populations. Right. Sure. <laughs> this research is so incredibly important and really fascinating. And I'm, it's encouraging to know the depth of research that's going on. And I'm excited to hear how this um, research will be shared out. I've been in 
this conversation has inspired me to become have a deeper understanding of the current research and what's going on. However, I need to shift topics and talk about more about your teaching experience. And I have listened to and been so moved by the Mazer's beautiful book, audiobook version, um, Emily, the story of a girl and her family hijacked by anorexia. I also lost my precious daughter, Katie, to anorexia at 25 years of age. The quote that Linda began with, teaching is more than imparting knowledge. It is inspiring change. Learning is more than absorbing facts. It is acquiring understanding. Janet, you've been teaching for decades, and it seems to me like this quote embodies what you're doing with your graduate students. Can you share why you chose the book, Emily, and tell us how it has impacted your students? Uh, yeah, um... Well, a colleague of mine at, at NISB, Barbara Smolik, met Jack and Linda at a comprehensive care centers for eating disorders event in Albany. And um, Barbara told me about um, the book, Emily's Story uh, and Jack and Linda's Mission. Um, I got the book, I read it, and I thought, this, gee, this will be an amazing addition to the grad course that I'm teaching at Columbia with the courses Eating Disorders Awareness, Prevention and Treatment. And it's... Um, it's offered to nutrition majors and um, psychology majors, uh, grad and uh, PhD level. And, you know, I have been teaching uh, a course for decades. Um, and in, during that time, I've witnessed, you know, so many changes in the field, the diagnostic cre- criteria. I've been through di- DSM-3, DSM-4, <laughs> DSM text review, now we're DSM-5. You know, so you know, there have been changes in the type of treatments, treatment settings, the diagnostic criteria, but really what hasn't changed is, you know, the pain, the suffering, the hopelessness um, that so many patients and their families have endured. Um, and, you know, as you, as you mentioned, Jack, you know, what you, what you don't use, you kind of lose, you know, you can say, okay, criterion A of the DSM-5, but students aren't going to remember that. Okay, but they are going to remember, hopefully, you know, lasting impressions of individuals that I hope they meet through my course. And I've always um, tried to find ways to include videos. I've used um, Dying to be Thin. I've used um, Thin from the Renfrew Center. And um, actually, you know, they've been quite effective in their own way. But really what they're what what you can glean from that is basically a snapshot. It's a period, it's a period in this person's life where they're already ill and you talk about their ex- treatment experience, but it doesn't, those types of um, multimedia don't really give you the opportunity to go through the process of someone's life and what happens. And that's what makes Emily's story so unique is that, you know, you, it's her journey, her, mm-hmm. you know, her childhood, her, her adolescence, her college experience, you know, her life experiences and, and how all of this, you know, played out around her eating disorder. And, um, you know, and it, to me, it's also important because we tend to think oh, anorexia nervosa, 13 year old girl. Well, anorexia nervosa, can occur in adulthood or, you know, late adolescence or in the twenties. And um, the other thing about Emily's story is that, you know, it gave a very um, moving, but very clear example of the extent of um, the types and degrees of medical comorbidity that occur in these individuals and you know the other psychological uh, conditions that can go along with an anxiety um you know um, substance related issues which often go along with anxiety um Mm -hmm. depression so it it 
Emily's story was really very is very unique uh, for that to that for that reason for me in terms of my course is that it really um, you get to know that person throughout the course of her life, the good parts and the very very difficult parts. Um, so I started signing the book as a required reading, a written paper. Um, and then, and Jack and Linda were so incredible to make time to come and have a discussion with the class and, and, you know, answer questions they had about their experiences. And I have to tell you that, you know, this, the reaction of the students to the book have, have been phenomenal. And if, if I may, I'd like to read a few quotes um, from some of the students, if that's okay. Um, that would be awesome. Okay, so these are quotes from students over the last two years. Um, obviously not all of them, but um, reading Emily was an eye-opening and heartbreaking experience for me uh, as both a reader and a trained clinician. Um, another, as an aspiring clinical psychologist, I'm always interested to learn how people experience their lives, how they suffer and how they make sense of their suffering. Emily provided valuable insights into all of those psychological experiences. Another student said, I'll take Emily's story with me as I continue my journey in this field. Another said, because of Emily's story, I strive to become a healthcare provider that will relentlessly advocate for eating disorder awareness, recovery, and education. Another stated, Emily's story holds a powerful lesson for all healthcare professionals. Another said, as a future healthcare professional, Emily's story has impacted me greatly. It, will, it reinforces and deepens the importance of empathy, empathy for the patients I will work with in any setting, as well as for their family members without judgment and with the utmost respect for each individual's situation. Um, so I have no doubt that this book has really um, impacted students and enriched the course and the chair of the department who just recently uh, went to um, Professor Emeritus um, Dr. Isabel Contento um, basically moderated my whole uh, 2020 course she read the book she was involved with and she was she also said that you know you know uh, she had she could only read it in sections then she had to step away from it because it's so emotionally provocative and for those of us in the field for a long time i think um you build up a, a little bit of a you know yes. emotional you know tolerance fortitude. but i think for people who are new to this um you know it really it takes you on a a very painful journey. Um, the other reason I think it's important, a book like this is, I mean, I found with, at least with nutritionists, that I found that nutritionists either really like to work with these patients or they find them like stressful and why don't they just want to eat? Absolutely. And, you know, We've you know, experienced and, that in the, and, in the field uh, for sure. Uh, and, you know, and I do think that another important point a part of this course is this is what it's all about this is as bad as it can get and if you don't feel that you're going to have the skill set to work with these patients then don't try don't start don't start, don't even I... start. you really either yeah. have it or you don't that's what i think um that is a powerful reason for having it part of your course and i that is exact what your students are saying is exactly why Jack and Linda wrote the book, why Emily wanted a book written. It's why we tell our stories. We start the conversation because what we lived in the truth, the whole timeline of what ha what happens with children with this disease needs to be understood and it needs to be felt on a very deep level because if we're going to change the outcomes, this needs to be understood. And one of the things that's rung really true as you've been speaking to me has been the conversation about continuation of care 
and how important that is. And it seems like these new people coming into the field, the story of Emily will really emphasize how important, not only do you have the research, but here is a very descriptive story of how important continuum of care is. And I, yeah, we are both, all of us here are sitting just taking a moment and breathing deeply. And it would be our hope that more and more graduate students were exposed to the real stories, the real issue. And if reading the book, Emily, is going to help... (laughs) It needs to be shared. It needs to be shared with more classrooms. And I think that reality, um, it is provocative. It was diff- I had to listen to it through the audio book. I, it was too difficult for me to read. And then I could read it in, or listen to it in sections at a time. And truly listening to Jack and Linda read that book is powerful. Um, Well, anybody who's lost a child uh, to anorexia or another eating disorder and and you read the book, it's, it's emotional. It's triggering, you know, I, I I mean, not, I mean, just, it takes you right back to what you experienced. That moment. Yeah. Um, And if it can happen to us, it can happen happen to anybody. Um, I don't, I, I would hope that it's it's not a, a triggering thing for somebody who has an eating disorder because we tried to be very careful not to use numbers and uh, weights and things like that. And um, But we tried very hard to just go back and from, from the beginning, um, our editor, uh, Renee Jacobson, and helped us content edit the book. And she said, you have to start at the beginning because we need to know Emily. And that was very good advice. And when we went back and did that, all the little things that were, that she didn't think about much at the time um, that maybe you brought up to the pediatrician or somebody, oh, that's normal. That's no, that's no big deal. It's just a fate, whatever. Just little things like having trouble sleeping and stuff like that from the time she was a baby. We made sure to put each one of those things in that book because we hope that if other people read it and it gets, you know, the more it gets out there that they, they won't let somebody tell them a medical professional, tell them it's no big deal. Cause maybe it is, you know, especially a medical professional is not trained in right. eating disorders, yeah. but yeah. you know, we've really just taken our, our pain and um, just turned it into a passion to try to help, help other people. And uh, Janet, you have helped us do that in a much larger way than we ever dreamed was possible. And it brings tears to my eyes to hear what your students um, have written. And I want to thank Teachers College, which, by the way, I think is a phenomenal, I mean, I've taught in three schools, grad school programs, and Teachers College is um, just a phenomenal faculty-student relationship and... You know, they give you a lot of latitude. They're int- they're really interested in, you know, what the professor is going to bring to the course, how the students, you know, they sit down with you afterwards. They sit down with the students. They really care about it. It's not like, okay, the course is over, goodbye, let's just move on. It's a phenomenal uh, nutrition program, but it's also the ability to bring in other students within the health and behavior studies department, the, the psych majors, um, this a couple of different site tracks as well. I'll, and I even had a school principal uh, the first year I was teaching. I taught this course for five years at Teachers College. And I think the second year I actually had a, a high school te- principal. And we said, okay, it's going to be a little challenging because this is kind of out of your area of specialty in terms of the medical stuff. But, you know, he really wanted to know about eating disorders. He really wanted to have a, a good sense of, you know, what 
these disorders were about. So, you know, we made that class work for him, even though it was not really designed for somebody, you know, as a high school principal. And, and, we, and we made it work for him. Um, so, you know, I, I, I do thank Teachers College for their, you know, their willingness to, you know, go with what, you know, faculty feels will be additive to a course. And they love the fact that you and Jack were able to, you know, work, come on board, talk to the students, you know, I, I'm not a big believer in midterms and finals and, and that level of teaching graduate school and, you know, PhD programs. I, I don't think you waste a whole, you know, two hour class or whatever it is. <laughs> having students spit stuff, they can, they can write a paper or something that spits stuff back to you. I, I think, I feel like it's a missed opportunity for teaching. So I just couldn't think of a better way to end the last two years there. What with a lasting impression of what that course was about. So. Well, we feel privileged oh to have gosh. been able to um, share Emily's story because it starts out just so ordinary, ha you know, happy, um, like what can I say? You know, just it just started out so ordinary, regular, good family life, and if it happened to us, it could happen to anybody. And I just thank Teachers College, and we thank you for uh, helping us to hopefully help somebody else, so that the same fate doesn't happen. We're on board for twenty twenty two. So, <laughs> well, you know, I just I, I was naive back when we started you know, in 2007, eight, nine, and then when Emily decided to try to get help herself in 2010, I just was so naive that I thought, well, you know, she's going to see doctors and they're going to help her and she's going to get better, you know, not realizing how little education they got needed. So, so Janet, thank you. And thank, you know, all people like you that are, that are trying to teach the new generation of, of uh, clinicians how to deal with these people. So thank you. Okay, so we have a couple more questions. So um, Ellen Bennett through her foundation, KMB for Answers, and Jack and I through our book are trying to spread awareness, understanding, and compassion for individuals who suffer with an eating disorder as well as for their families. We have made some progress, but we still have a long way to go. The statistics show only one in 10 people with an eating disorder seek treatment. We understand part of this is because of the shame and stigma of having an eating disorder. But part of it is because people who are not diagnosed and some, that, uh, some of that may be because of a lack of education about eating disorders in our medical community. That being said, Janet, do you have any thoughts on how we can encourage more medical professionals to specialize in treating these serious, complex, misunderstood and often deadly illnesses? Yeah, well, I thought a lot about that question, and I thought that I first needed to take a step back and, and think about, okay, um, I do feel like first, and you brought up an important point with, you know, uh, watching out for, you know, subtle signs. I think we need to first think about the frontline professionals, um, you know, and over the years, I mean, teachers, elementary school, high school, gym teachers, and we had a kid at Schneider whose gym teacher caught hmm. sight of one of the girls changing out of changing in the locker room and realized how cachectic this individual was. And, you know, coaches who have really um, can have negative and positive impact. You know, years and years ago, I guess over 30 years ago, there was an article in the um, one of the Long Island papers about a coach on Long Island at a high school who was encouraging his female students to keep their weight low enough so they wouldn't have a menstrual period because it just got in the way of the track meets. And, and you know, and, and this this blew up. I mean, it got out there and, you know, the paper went, you know, went with it. And but we know in, in all of these mm -hmm. elite athletes, you know, um, what some of these individuals are put through in terms of weight. Um, so it starts with, I think, our educators, 
you know, what's happening in j- just in regular medical care, you know, pediatricians, you know, I would say plot those growth charts. Make sure you're plotting the growth charts and you're plotting them properly. You know, learn to ask some screening questions and sometimes learn to ask difficult questions um, that may be somewhat sensitive to families. You know, you have internists, you have gastroenterologists treating GERD, abdominal distress, constipation, diarrhea problems that are not looking for the signs of eating disorders. Um, OBGYN, women being treated for menstrual irregularity or infertility problems that are not being asked questions about how they eat and how they're maintaining their weight. And of course, understanding that not everyone with an eating disorder is underweight. You have right. a, a, you know groups of individuals with atypical eating disorders that are normal weight or slightly above normal weight, and they're highly restricting and their their eating behaviors are very deleterious and it affects fertility and pregnancy outcomes. Um, endocrinologists that, you know, where there's delayed growth or early osteopenia, osteoporosis that need to, to ask these questions. Dentists, I had a student at Post who was a dentist and she was injured. Um, she was kicked by a horse. She was an equestrian and she uh, incurred traumatic dr- brain injury and she could no longer practice dentistry and went to get um, her registered uh, went to school to become a registered dietitian. But her master's thesis, she um, went out there to, to really um, find out, you know, what dentists knew and what dentists were willing to do about a suspected eating disorder. And by and large, the ones that even responded to her questionnaire, which were, was not a large number, many of them thought an eating disorder was obesity. And, you know, one of the quickest, you know, one of the most visible characteristics in somebody who's purging is dental erosion. And it has a characteristic look to it, you know, in terms of mm-hmm. where the mm-hmm. vomitus hits the back of the teeth and where the erosion is. Mm-hmm. And about 30 years ago, the Princess Diana Fund actually funded training in the UK um, to educate dentists. And one of the things that came up with, you know, you have a 15 or half an hour appointment with this patient and do you open up this can of worms when you don't know who to send them to, you know, so that's all part of these, you know, whether it's the, you know, the dentist or, you know, the emergency room doc, which you would hope would have somebody right there on site. That they could call in for a consult you know, if they suspected something. But I think a lot of times, um, you know, you really need to have a network of trusted people you can refer your patients to right then and there. If you suspect an eating disorder, um, they're out there. Physicians need to know it. They should have names of, you know, nutritionists, psychologists, psychiatrists, somebody that they can say, look, let's work together here. Let me send you for a referral to a good, a colleague of mine, you know, Dr. Smith. Maybe we can figure out what's going on here. I work for a pediatric practice. I moon, I still work with this guy from time to time, but I, I, I did moonlighting there for about 15 years because I didn't want to lose touch with babies and failure to thrive and growth and stuff like that. And, you know, when we had anything we suspected that was going on with somebody, we had a referral base set up. So, um, and, and then it brings us to, you know, what kind of specialized opportunities that are out there to really train people, you know, do you have what it's going to take to work in the field with patients with eating disorders? And then, you know, then it has to be, you know, exploring opportunities for specialized training, fellowships, like we have fellows here that come in for training that apply and get accepted and they come into fellowship training programs and work in research, but also work with um, uh, clinical care of our patients. Um, the opportunities to do internships or externships. One of my students from Post, uh, uh, from Teachers College last year, um, uh, the year before last, was actually doing an externship here, um, psychology major, uh, working on a PhD in our eating disorder unit. Um, so there are opportunities out there um, that have to be explored. And I also think that um, there's taking advantage of training and educational opportunities, you know, uh, Academy for Eating Disorders has great opportunities for training and some supportive um, 
Training Opportunities Society for Adolescent Health and Medicine, SAM, um, an organization that I've, uh, I've you know, worked with for years at Schneider Children's Hospital, um, the American Psychiatric Association. Um, they just uh, put out um, uh, practice guidelines are currently under review, the new practice guidelines, which I've been invited to review, um, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. All of these professional organizations have some opportunities for um, small grants or larger um, supporting mechanisms or, you know, just sell your own education. When I was at Schneider and we wound up with an adolescent medicine, you know, the first thing I did was talk my boss into buying me the biology of human starvation volumes one or two, which are <laughs> antiques at this point and probably worth a good amount of money and just read everything I could read, you know, every article I could get every, you know, you, you, if you have the passion for this population, you have to make yourself knowledgeable about what, you, you know, there's plenty in publication. So you can have formalized education or you can set about a track for yourself and how to best educate yourself and collaborate with peers. I mean, the Academy of uh, Eating Disorders is, is a great way to start as well. Um, but I think it gets down to if, if you really find that you can't work with this patient population, then you really shouldn't be working with them. And I, but I, I also think it kind of gets back to what you talked about earlier, um, was that how the medical system has changed and how, you know, it, it, when I was at Schneider, which was not a research, it was a you know a, an insurance-based program. But when patients needed to be readmitted, they were readmitted, and if they needed to stay for a month or two months, they stayed. Our healthcare <laughs> system has changed. I think has changed in a way that makes it harder for patients to get care. Um, yeah. now, I mean, I know that family-based therapy seems to be the most endorsed type of treatment for adolescents, um, uh, but we know it's not for everyone and people mm -hmm. need treatment options yeah. and that may include, you know, longer stays in hospitals for some individuals versus others, you know. Well, that's my ultimate goal. Once we uh, get the medical professions more trained is to sit down with the insurance industry and, and let them know because I know how much was spent on Emily's treatment, and um, it didn't have to be that much. And ultimately, she she uh, died from it. So if they treated her right the first time when she went for treatment in 2010, I think uh, I, well, Lynn and I die. both believe that she would still be here. And um, so yeah, I mean, so when you think about it, we need to train the mental health providers, therapists, psychologists, social workers, counselors, substance abuse specialists, guidance counselors. But we also do have to find a way to involve um, health insurance professionals and, and providers because they're really the gatekeepers to treatment. I mean, ultimately, you know, I worked at a time where um, physicians didn't have to spend every other day on the phone, you know, asking yeah. for another day of treatment. Yeah. You know, right. It, right. you know, it's the healthcare system has changed in a way that does make inpatient hospitalization much more difficult. And I think you're right. I think for some individuals, if you add up all of these short you know, the emergency room visits and the yeah. two-day trip, you know, out of state to gain two pounds and be sent home. By the time you add the cost of all of this up, for certain individuals, a longer length of stay might be much more um, cost-effective and also effective in terms of the person's, you know, treatment. Not everybody needs that, but for those who do, it, it shouldn't be an impossibility in our healthcare system. It shouldn't be. Okay. Um, well, we're almost out of time, but um, would you like to share um, anything else with us or a, a, a personal well, you know, story? I think, you know, I'll, I'll be very careful to make it very vague enough to be de-identified, but, 
you know, I think back again when uh, I was at Schneider and, you know, in my 20s and um, we had a family with a, a lovely young adolescent, maybe about 13 or 14. And um, we had a really good program there. But this individual had a tough go round and she was hospitalized a few times. And I remember um, uh I believe it was the mom and Dr. Michael Nussbaum was the director of the eating disorder uh, unit at that point in time, a, a great adolescent medicine specialist. And, you know, mom said, how, how many, how many more times are we going to have to go through this? You know, how many more times are we going to have to go through this? And Dr. Nussbaum just said, until she gets it right. <laughs> and, you know, and, and she did get it right. And, and the beauty of that program was that, you know, she remained in our treatment largely on an outpatient basis and through high school and college and came back to visit us, you know, after college and then went on for an advanced professional degree. And um, I had dinner with her two weeks ago. We had oh, dinner, yeah. you know, <laughs> quite frequently and, um, you know, this is somebody that I've known over 40 years that you could really, um, you know, and, and, you know, she was severely anorexic when she was young, but she, she made it. And, you know, it's very hard to say, you know, why, um, you know, why she was this fortunate. Um, but I do think having continuity of care and a treatment team that, you know, um, somebody can connect with and know that they're, it's, they're always there. I mean, mm -hmm. if she came home on break, she'd come in and visit with us and she would, you know, we were very connected with her therapist. Connection, or connection, connection, connection. I was thinking the Con same. Thing. Continuity and, you know, and it's fun going out to dinner with her. Yeah. <laughs> it really yeah. well. is fun going out to dinner with her. And there are other patients that I have also you know, kept up with over the years and really had the pleasure of seeing them, you know, get better, stay better. Um, one of one of the individuals who really struggled with um, more atypical uh, anorexia nervosa and, and, and a lot of, you know, uh, eating behaviors, uh, binging, purging, vomiting, and, you know, she married um, and always said, like, well, that's it. My kids are never going to have an eating disorder. That's it. You know, I'm going to make sure. And she had a very rough, rocky course, too. Mm -hmm. She had many hospitalizations. And her firstborn wound up having very severe food allergies, which would result in projectile vomiting. And she was like, you know, I, I can't believe I, you know, I'm running around the house saying, no, you can't eat this. No, you can't eat that. She said, you know, I, the one thing I never wanted to do was to have a child have, have that kind of relationship with food. And, you know, here I am with a kid with uh, severe food allergies and, you know, projectile vomiting. So, you know, it is nice to, the benefit of working in the field for a long time is that you do, despite, you know, the, the pain and suffering that's out there you also have the it's really wonderful to uh actually see people get better some struggle a little mm -hmm. bit yeah. but they can still have a fairly normal healthy life right. and um i guess for me though i mean you know as an educator a researcher um and having i think probably still for me the most rewarding part of my experience was when I could sit at the, on the end of the bed with one of the adolescents at Schneider Children's Hospital and just sitting down and saying, like, you know, how is this going? Um, you know, what can we do to make it better? Um, you know, still think for me that clinical piece was probably um, um, the thing I probably the thing I miss the most right now, but also I think the thing that I learned the most from yeah. was that interaction with patients and their families. Well, that's because you care, you know, you really care. So it's so evident. You're yeah. an exceptional professor, uh, registered nutrition, a nutritionist and dietitian, and just an exceptional caring person who's made an impact on so many lives and in so many families' lives 
through very difficult times, and people do not forget connections like that because they're sacred. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. and you don't forget the patients that you've worked with like that either, you know, and I do. I do hear from patients from time to time over the years that have developed other, you know, nutritional issues that separate apart from their eating disorder that, you know, will contact me and say, yeah, I'm having a problem with this. You know, we're all getting older, so all of a sudden <laughs> problems, uh, <laughs> yeah. different things crop up. But it, it is nice to have established those relationships. But one thing I never mentioned to you, Jack, was that I was actually going to school to be a pharmacist. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, decided that uh, nutrition was it, so... Well, we're out of time, and I'm sorry we, we could we could we talk could here, here the, for the rest, rest of the, of the afternoon. afternoon. Yeah. Um, but I want to uh, say thank you. I'm sure Ellen and Jack want to say thank you. This has been awesome. Thank you so much. It's about having the conversations. That's why we're here, and we just appreciate your time so much. I'm going to also add. Please tell your friends and families about Once Shattered, picking up the pieces. Rate, review, and share. And remember, there will be links and resources for this episode in the show notes. And I think this might be a good addition to the Teachers College course is to assign some of the uh, podcasts to them as well. Yeah. We're loving it. Uh, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> so, and to our listeners, please help us spread the awareness and compassion for those with all mental illness conditions. And um, rate and review this podcast on the platform that you're listening to it on. And we cannot say goodbye without properly thanking our talented producer and sound engineer, Scott Fitzgerald of Rockbox Recording and Production for expertly producing this podcast. Thank you, Scott. And thank you, Dr. Janet Shebendock. You are amazing. And it's just been such a privilege to be here today. Thank you, Ellen and Jack. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you so much.